How are we doing, United City Church? Hey, it's good to see you in the room, and if you're like, who is that guy? Hey, my name's Pat. I'm the United City Youth Pastor, and man, I love preaching on Sunday. Um, it's just so great, but before we get going, can we do something real quick? Can we just thank United City Collective? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Tyler, you need to know 90% of that applause is going to Mallory, but other than that, it was great, dude, so... Hey, listen, if it's your first time in the room, I just want to say welcome. We really are so glad and honored that you would give some real estate uh, in your life to this place. If you're watching online, it's your first time watching, or maybe you're on vacation, and we're glad to see you too. But here's what I want to do. I want to give a very personal, like honest to goodness, heartfelt welcome to all of the men at the Ramsey Unit and all of the women who are watching from the Plain State Correctional Facility. Not in the notes, just from me to you, um, your faith stirs my faith. When I hear about what God is doing in your life and in your midst, it makes me ready to charge hell. So, man, we love you. We're so glad that you're joining with us. If you want, you can open your Bible to Psalm chapter 91. That's where we're going to be this morning. We're in week three, actually, of a sermon series called Summer in the Psalms. And I don't know about you, but Summer in the Psalms is like probably one of my favorite series we end up doing in a year. And so, man, Pastor Dave Kinney preached the paint off these walls last week, did he not? It was so good. And there's just something about the Psalms. Uh, they're, I'm going to be honest with you. They're hard to preach, right? They're hard to preach. But there's just something about the Psalms, like when you get into it, uh, and you're looking at the journal entries and the life of faith of, of some of these people and what they've experienced and how they've experienced God. I mean, just God just moves. He shows up in a way that's just unpredictable. And so today we're going to look at Psalm 91. And I just think it makes sense, like we've been doing in this series, if we're going to be looking at the songs of Scripture to sing a song together. Okay, so after we're jumping, uh, after we're done looking at Psalm 91, we're going to sing a song. So please don't leave during that time. Like, don't dip out. We built time in for it. I'm going to preach shorter. <laughs> LOL. And, um, and we're going to respond to God uh, through a song. So here's what I want to do. Actually, I want to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. Maybe pray for your friends who you brought or you know that are watching online that need Jesus. And let's just ask, ask God to, to come and be in the middle of Psalm 91 this morning. So God, we do invite you in. God, I pray personally first for fuel. God, would you sustain me? Um, God, give me the energy to preach a psalm that has chewed me up and spit me out the other side. God, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, whether that's physically in the room or watching right now live or watching in the future um, in a recording. God, would you break through in power in their life? Holy Spirit, would you invade the atmosphere that they're in right now? And would you come and do what only you can do? And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. This weekend was great for me. I went to Galveston. It was beach day, you know, if you can call it a beach. Am I right? Like, we're, it's, it's our beach, so we can talk bad about it. So let's do that for a second. Galveston sucks. Um, the main thing that I don't like is you don't have the beachy smell. Like, you get out and you're ready for the salt in the air smell. It's not there, Okay. It just smells like, I don't know, a bunch of people. And so we went this weekend, though, to the beach. I'm getting lost. We went to the beach. It was great. It was Kylie, um, our kids. I have, I have two kids. I have a son named Theo. He's five, about to turn six, going to kindergarten, pray for me. And then I have a daughter. Her name's Phoebe Jo. She's three, as I was informed the other day. I've been, I, I, I've been telling people so long she's four. So that's on the level of parent, that's where I am, okay? And so... But we also went with some friends from our life group. Plug for a life group. If you don't have one, get in one, all right? Like you got built-in beach friends, which is great because I don't own anything for the beach. And we mooched off of everybody, okay? We used their canopy. We used their towels. We used their toys for the kids. We used their Yeti coolers. I don't have a Yeti, okay? And so it was like, it was amazing. And so Galveston Beach Day, and it was pretty good for what it was, right? Like it was a pretty great day. And right now my kids are in swim lessons. They're in survival swim. And so they feel pretty confident about themselves, so it's fun to watch them in the water, but we went ahead and put floaties on them too because, you know, the ocean, she'll get you. And so, um, you know, we're playing, and it's a pretty nice day. I'm, I'm playing with Theo in the waves. He's like, Daddy, let's go deep. And I'm like, I'm 5'6". There's only so deep we're going, dog. And so, like, we're going out there, and he's like, let's go deeper and deeper. So we're out there, and he can't, you know, touch, and I'm seeing him, and it's kind of cool because... I'm watching him build confidence, you know. He's doing the whole wave thing, which I don't get, but it's fine. It's like, it's fun to just ride a wave. 
and then another one, and, and it never ends. It's the most boring thing in the world. And so, but I'm with my son. I'm out there. We're riding the waves, and it's fun. And he's getting confident. He's getting a little bit further from me, a little bit further from me. I'm getting to him, making sure, you know, like current doesn't take him out. And um, at one point, we're swimming, and this, this wave, like a little wave, just kind of comes up and kind of like, you know, kisses his face. It's right over the nose and the mouth. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And immediately, what is it? He looks at me. He's like, am I okay? Like, is, you know, like, are you going to do anything or am I good? You know, like, it's like, if you freak out, they freak out, right? But I'm calm. I'm like, no, you're good. But what I didn't do was prepare him for the massive wave that was on the heels of it. And so, like, he gets a little touch. He's, <laughs> he's looking at me. He turns around and gets destroyed. And it was kind of cool to watch. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> now, I'm talking, he, my man gets wrecked and it pulls him he's wearing the floaty but it pulls him under the water and then he pops back up his eyes are closed he's snotting like he's crying he's <laughs> like on 10 you know and he's freaking out and the first thing he does when he breaks through the water he goes daddy where are you and I'm like I'm right here and he just throws his hands up and he's like save me it's a pretty dumb thing to do like swim dude you know like I don't he's like save me and I just wonder if that's you. I just wonder if that's you in the room today. Like not swimming in Galveston, not, not battling waves at the beach, but in your life there are just some things that they just roll in on you. They come out of the blue, and maybe, maybe they're small at first, and they just, it's kind of small enough to get your attention and to take your breath away. And then maybe they get bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, maybe you're not messing around with, waves in the gulf, but maybe the marriage is on the rocks. Maybe your kid is super rebellious. Maybe that credit card debt is only getting bigger and not smaller. Maybe the worries about our current political state and the state of the world and inflation and gas prices and politics. Maybe your relationships have gone south. Maybe you're looking at loss of business. And the waves, they're just coming in over and over and over again, crashing and crashing and crashing. And it, and it feels like maybe you ride a wave and, and you get to the other side of it and you're safe and you're okay and you turn around just to get blasted by another one. I think the reality is if I just handed the mic around and, and we wrestled with the real tension in the room today is that we were all facing the waves that life has to throw at us. Maybe the wave for some of you is death and loss, a cancer diagnosis, chemo treatments, a funeral. Maybe, maybe there are some big things in your life that just feel like the waves are pulling you under. So I guess the question this morning, the question we have to answer, if the tension is real, if, if there are waves and they're, they're crashing onto the shore of our life, the question is this, what do you reach for to find security? Like, when it all falls apart, when life is unraveling, when, when you get hit with a wave, what do you reach for when it all falls apart? And I think Psalm 91 is a great place to go to try to answer that question of, of as followers of Jesus, what should we reach for when the waves of life threaten to drag us under? Psalm 91 in your Bible. We actually don't know who wrote Psalm 91. There, there are some speculation and arguments that say, hey, maybe David wrote Psalm 91. There's some military language in here. Maybe Moses wrote Psalm 91. There's a, there's a lot of talk of, of things that Moses would have seen in the desert, a lot of talks of plagues and pestilence and things that Moses would have witnessed. And we don't know who wrote Psalm 91, but we do know that whoever wrote it in the first two verses gives us a major theological framework on how to view God. That in the first two verses of Psalm 91, we are about to have our perspective and our priorities shifted by the word of God as to who he is and how we interact with him. Psalm 91 verses 1 through 2 says this, he or she, okay, ladies, you can read yourself into this. He or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. I would underline those two things. My refuge and my fortress. You are my God in whom I trust. Do you see it? Do you see the shift? Do you see the major theological confession that just took place in Psalm 91 verses 1 through 2? If you missed it, here it is. God 
is a dwelling place. God is a dwelling place. He's not just something to be looked at from afar. He's not just something we approach on a Sunday morning and then put him back in the religion box and leave. No, God is a dwelling place. And if he is a dwelling place, and if I can get so close that I can go to his shelter, what does the psalm, psalmist also say? I can rest in his shadow. He's approachable. Think about that. I can get so near to God. I can get so physically close that I'm actually in his shadow. See, God is a dwelling place. I can come near to him. I can get close to him. His presence is powerful enough to be my shelter and my resting place. And, and here's the thing. It's a dwelling place. It's a place to live. It's a place to put down roots. It's a place to unpack your bags and stay a while. You can move in and live there. One pastor says this about Psalm 91, 1 through 2. He says this, every child of God looks towards the inner sanctuary, yet all, oh my gosh, yet all do not dwell in it. They run to it at times and enjoy occasional approaches. Man, if that boot fits, lace it up and wear it this morning. They run to it at times, and they, they enjoy the benefits of religion. They enjoy the benefits of church membership now and again, but they do not habitually reside in the presence. And God is a dwelling place. Listen, God's presence isn't a bed and breakfast. It's not like you check in at your earliest convenience and then check out. It's not like a little escapism I'm going to run to him when things are bad and my grades are failing and the relationship is bad and the health diagnosis is, is kind of sketchy and like I'm just going to check in and then all of a sudden, oh, there's some requirements, there's some things. No, I'm out. It's a dwelling place. It's a place to live and draw close. And what happens when you choose to habitually reside in the presence of God? He changes for who you are. Your perspective changes. Your relationship changes. He becomes two things. The psalmist says, my refuge and my fortress. Now, when I was preparing for this sermon and I was doing some study, I don't know about you, my Hebrew is a little rusty. I was like, maybe the psalmist is just like redundant. Maybe it's like I'm going to say two things twice, like I'm strong, you know, and I work out to make the same point. But that's not true. Actually, the psalmist is using two different words to mean two different things. And he'll spend the rest of the time in the psalm, and we will spend the rest of the time this morning unpacking what does it mean for God to be my refuge, and what does it mean for God to be my fortress. Because when I dwell in the shelter of the Most High, when I, when I rest and abide in the shadow of the Almighty, God becomes two specific things, my, my refuge and my fortress. God is my refuge. The best place to think about refuge is refuge is, refuge is where I run to hide. Reminds me of sixth grade, Taylor Sims, the bully, the bane of my existence. One time he bullied me so bad I ran from the middle school, and I lived in a small town, to my house, through the yard, made it in the door, slammed it behind me, safe. Maybe for some of y'all, it'd be better to think about you know, and you turn the lights off in the basement and you run up the stairs for whatever demon is like chasing you, don't act like you've never done it. I mean, something about turning those lights off. Something's out there, I'm running, but when I get to the bed, it's like I'm safe. You know, if my hand's off to the side, they go get me. It's best to think about my refuge, man. It's a place that I run to for security. See, look at me. I flee to God. When God is my refuge, I flee to him for protection or for deliverance. That's exactly what the psalmist is going to teach here in verses 3 through 10. Look at what it says in verse 3. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by the day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my what? My refuge. That is different. He's my refuge. He's my safe place. I can run to him and be protected, verse 10, and no evil will overtake you. 
No disaster will come near your tent. Look at me, United City Church, it is of paramount importance. Watching online, it is so important that you get that verse 3 says what it says. It doesn't say God will delete all the bad things. It says God will deliver you from all the bad things. Look at me, they don't just disappear. It's not like the cancer diagnosis just disappears. It's not like the rough time at work disappears. It's not like the family drama disappears. All the scary stuff doesn't go away. That's not what the Bible says. Actually, the Bible doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say that the enemy with traps goes away. No, it says there is an enemy and he does have traps. It doesn't say, oh, there's no terrors in the night. You're lying to your kids. The Bible says there are terrors in the night. It doesn't even say that there won't be arrows, pestilence, and death. It just says that God will make a way for you to be delivered. It goes above that and says he's not just going to deliver you. He's going to deliver you. Listen to me. This is important. He doesn't just deliver you from it. He delivers you from the fear of it. Last week, Dave talked about this. Psalm 91 is talking about this. You remember when we said your faith has to interrupt your feelings? You remember that? Like you really remember that? Your faith has to interrupt your feelings. Here's what Psalm 91 is saying. I'm not fearing what my faith has covered. I'm not going to fear what my faith has covered. That's why a little girl at 14 named Esther can walk into a throne room and say, if I die, I die. That's why Daniel can walk up to the furnace and say, man, you can throw us in if you want or not. That's why Elijah on Mount Carmel can say, dude, bring the prophets, bring the soldiers, cut yourself, whatever. Actually, go ahead and dump, dump buckets of water on my sacrifice. Because my faith has it covered. That's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he's about to die, prays to God and says, if we can do this any other way, let's do it any other way, but actually my faith has it covered. Let's do it your way. See, the truth is we put our faith in all the wrong things. We're asking the wrong things to cover us. I'm putting my faith in my finances to cover us. I'm putting my faith in my plans and my provision to cover us. I'm putting my faith in my ability to lead to cover us. I'm putting my faith in a white house to cover us. What are you talking about? you got to put your faith in something that has the power to cover you. And Psalm 91 says, no, no, no. It's not that the scary things go away. It just means that they can't overtake you. Look at verse 9 and 10. That's what it says. They won't overtake you. See, look at me. The presence of the enemy is not more powerful than the presence of your God. And I, me, not even you, me, I just personally want the type of faith that says if I, if I meet opposition along the way, it must mean I'm going in the right direction. That if there are things along the way that set themselves against me, it's not that God isn't, isn't for me, it's that someone is against me. And that someone is the enemy. And so Psalm 91 isn't about, man, your life's just going to be perfect. Psalm 91 is that when your life falls apart, God is actually big enough to save you from it. There are things that God is protecting you from that you'll never even know about. And so I'm not going to fear because God is my refuge. And then he talks about God is my fortress. Best way to think about your fortress it's like a forward operating base. You play Call of Duty? Yeah, me neither. Dave will fire me. <laughs> Big anti-video game guy. Listen, I was texting a Marine friend of mine last night. I said, hey, dude, can you, like at 939, can you give me the definition of a FOB? And he's like, weird, but yeah. He's like, you know, a forward operating base. Actually, I wrote down what he said. He said this. It's a base that serves units engaged in forward oper operation against the enemy with logistics, supply, and air support. He said the idea is, is that there are units who are forwardly engaged, like tip of the spear, and, and this forward operating base is a little bit further out in front, and it's a place that is strategically put to equip and resource and supply and send forces as they go out and operate and come back to the forward operating base so that, so that way we don't give up ground. We could be forward operating. We're forward operating. Listen to me. God is a fortress. I don't know about you, but living for Jesus is hard. Even in Texas. 
No, like honestly, be real with me. If I'm going to do the whole salt and light thing, if I'm going to do the whole, if you obey me, you'll love my commandments. If I'm going to do the whole be holy for I am holy, if I'm going to do all that, man, it's hard. But Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus saved us and sent us forward to be kingdom makers, to drag heaven into this historical moment. So when, when I'm out in front living as salt and light, how many of you know the attacks of the enemy come against me? And so I, I don't just need a refuge, I need a fortress. I need to run back to God and be resupplied with vision. God, what is your vision? What's your plans for me? Jeremiah 29, 11. God has got a plan for you and a purpose for you. He created you in his image to go and do good works. If he just says before, the world was even created. So I got to be resupplied. I got to be resupplied in community. I got to have my faith strengthened. I got to have people around me who are still pointing me in the right direction. And so, yeah, God's my refuge, but he's also my fortress. Listen, we haven't even got to the verse. Listen to what the, these verses say. Verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. The implication here is that your ways are running after God's. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread, you will tread, you will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. When I read this in my Bible, I was like, oh, I recognize that. I don't know about you, but something immediately went off my head. I was like, I recognize that. I recognize that. What is that? There's something, there's something sticking out of the ground there that I recognize, and it's this. What other character in the Bible is described as both the lion and a snake? There's only one other person in the Bible that's described as a hungry lion roaming, seeking those who he can devour. There's only one other character who's described as being more crafty and cunning than all the other serpents. You know who it is? Satan, the accuser, the one who accuses you to God. You're trying to follow Jesus and Satan is accusing you. Yeah, but look at what they did. Look at how they messed up. Look at how they failed there. Look at, look at, look at, look at, look. The accuser, the one who whispers in your ear, that's not what God really meant for you. That's not really what the Bible means. God's design isn't better than your desires. And, and so the accuser and, and the enemy, the Bible is saying, hey, when you're living, when you're following after God, I'm not just your refuge, I'm your fortress. And when I'm your fortress, listen, when, when you're guarded by the blood of Jesus and when you're lifted up by the cross of Christ, you with me? Listen, your Bible speaks, you with me? Like your Bible talks about the fact that Jesus' blood has imputed righteousness to you, which means that when God looks at you, he doesn't see your best day and worst day, he only sees the life of Jesus, which means when I live, I'm living from a fortress, but I'm living my life as the righteousness of Christ. And I may mess up and I may make mistakes, but the power's in my past of what God has saved me from. So I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward because I'm from a forward operating base of bringing light and salt to a dark world. I'm, I'm trampling. See, when God is my fortress, I trample the enemy instead of being trampled by the enemy. And when is God my fortress? When I'm resting in the shadow. When I'm hiding in the shelter of the Most High. So, so the question, I mean, the, really the question is, how do you, okay, Pat, that's cool. I want the refuge. I, I want the fortress. How do you get that? How do, you, how do you dwell? How do you get so close to God that you're under his shadow, that you're in his stronghold? How, how do you get that? Well, something amazing is about to happen in Psalm 91. The, these last verses, a shift is about to take place, which is why I believe in divinely authored scripture. Because all of Psalm 91 to this point has been a man talking about God. But with no explanation, you're about to watch, you're about to watch the, the narrative change. Now the scripture is going to be as if God is talking about men and women. And, and look at what verse 14 says. Because he holds fast to me in love. The, the, the writing's just changed. New character talking here. Because he or she holds fast to me in love, I will what? I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. How do you, how do you cling to God? How do you get into the dwelling place? How do you put down roots there? How do you rest in his shadow? You hold fast to him in love. God's looking and says, because they hold fast to me in love, 
and because they know my name. And here's, you're about to see something amazing. When, when, I get, when I get close to God, when I draw near, it's like there's this picture in Psalm 91 of physical proximity and, and mental proximity. He said, hey, because they hold fast to me in love, because they're so close to me and they know my name. It makes me think about Phoebe Jo. Phoebe Jo, right now, she gives me the best hugs in the world. She's great. She'll run to me, Daddy. She grabs a hold of me. Doesn't matter who's in. It could be Katie Perkle. Doesn't matter. And she'll run right past her. Grab a hold of me. And, you know, sometimes Phoebe Jo holds on to me so fast. She, she holds on to me so tight. I, I move my arms, and what happens? She just stays there. I, like, walk around the house like she's a little leech, you know? But it's cool because I'm strong. So she's, like, 35 pounds. She holds fast to me, but sometimes, sometimes we'll be in the house and she's trying to get my attention. I'll be in the kitchen cooking because I'm a man. I like to cook. And I'll be doing something. I'm working on something or, or I'm a distracted dad and I'm being a bad parent. I'm on my phone. I'm in my office reading a book. And she'll say, Daddy, 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 Dad, 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 Daddy Patrick. <laughs> because she knows my name. And she knows that she can call my name and it cuts through the clutter and the chaos and she knows that because she's close to me she can call out and she can call me by my name in psalm 91 man it's it's this amazing amazing passage of scripture here at the end that isn't just saying man god's presence is a dwelling place you can get so close to him actually the last three verses are saying how much god will come close to you saying, oh, no, no, it's not just that he's a dwelling place. It's not that you get just so close to be under his shadow. It's actually how close I want to come to you. And how close is he willing to come? Look at all these I will statements in the last three verses. I will deliver him. I will protect him. I will answer him. I will be with him. I will rescue him. I will satisfy him. I will show him my salvation. And I don't know about you, but with, with all the pretense and the fake, just drop, I need that in my life. I don't, I don't just need a refuge. I don't just need a fortress. I need God to hold fast to me. I, I need all of those things. And so if there's really only one thing that you write down, it needs to be the answer to that question. It needs to be the only thing that you remember is where do you, what do you reach for when it all falls apart? Well, when it all falls apart, hold fast to Jesus. When it all falls apart, hold fast to Jesus because he's the only thing that can hold fast back to you. And man, how, look at me, how many things are we trying to hold fast to? How many different things are we trying to hold fast to to make our fortress how many things are we trying to hold fast to, to to make our safe place? I mean, we hold fast to all the wrong things. Given the chance, we will hold fast to things that have no power and ability to hold fast back to us. And so when the waves get high, when they're crashing in, when it smacks you in the face, when it threatens to pull you under, man, hold fast to Jesus. Because he's the only thing that can refresh and protect you. And some of you in the room, you're like, okay, but that's hard. That's hard. Like, you don't, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the waves that I'm facing. You don't know what's crashing against my life. It's, it's hard. And I would just say that I know. I know, like, look at me. Honestly, I know because Because I remember the wave. I remember the wave that crashed into me. I remember the wave that almost drowned my life. In an ultrasound room with my wife at 36 weeks pregnant with our first baby. They were having some trouble. We gotta go to the, we gotta go to another room. Kinda look at me, something's wrong, something is so, baby, nothing's wrong. 
getting to the full ultrasound, having the nurse practitioner come in, pulling up an image. I, I know what I'm supposed to see. 36 weeks in, we're three or four weeks away. I, I know what I'm supposed to see. I'm supposed to see the flutter of my baby's heartbeat. I'm supposed to see my baby moving around. And what I see is death. I remember that nurse practitioner, she didn't know what to say. She just, I'm sorry. I pulled out my phone, I called my mentor. I'm working at a church with him at the time. I said, hey, you, you, gotta, you literally have to come rescue me. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm at, I just need you to come get me. The nurse is like, well, just, you take as much time as you want. I remember as soon as she leaves, I, I fell over the sink that's in the room because I feel like I'm about to vomit. I feel like I'm about to throw, I'm about to lose it. I'm so mad. I'm so mad. God, this isn't fair. This is, how is this fair? And I'm crying and I'm ing, ing. And in that moment, my wife just calm. Patrick, Patrick. I look over at her. It's the only thing she said to me. We have to cling to Jesus. What? Can I be real? Pastor on stuff? What are you, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. I don't want to do that right now. I want to scream. I want to cuss. I want to rip stuff off the walls. We go home. And the doctor come back in before we left and said, hey, listen, you got to come back tonight. You have to deliver this baby. I remember the anger. How could you ask my wife to do that? How could you ever ask her to do that? I remember going home to my mentor's house in a safe place. I remember crying and holding fast to Jesus and holding fast to my wife and crying so hard that Kylie's makeup ruined their like perfect white pottery barn sheets. I remember that night they made a, they, they brought us steak and said, hey, you gotta eat. Here's some really good food you gotta eat. I remember that night my pastors coming over and putting their hands and praying for us. I remember really special friends and close people being in that house praying for us. I remember driving to the hospital. I remember my wife getting hooked up to the Pitocin drip. I remember sitting for 15 hours, wave after wave after wave, crushing me. I remember when Judah was born, watching them unravel my son, getting to hold my son, but nothing else getting to love my son, receive nothing else. I remember instead of going home with a baby, going home with a little bean bag measured out to his length and his size, so Kylie and I didn't have post-traumatic stress breakdown, having to sleep with it and hold it for a certain um, many hours a day. Look at me, I know about the waves. I know about the waves. I was sitting front row in my baby's funeral watching him lower his casket into the ground. I know about the waves. but I also know about the God who can be a refuge in a fortress. I know about the God who can hide you under the covering of his wings. I know about the God who can say, even though there's all this evil around you, it won't overtake you. I know about your faith overcoming your feelings. I know because I lived it, because I had to walk through it, because I never would have chosen it for myself and I never would have chosen it again. And and so many people have come up to me and Kylie and said, I don't know how you ever do that. When we we get courage to talk about our story, they say, I don't know how you could do that. I can never get through that. I I don't know how. And and I would just say this, whether, no matter what you're going through, you know how? You know how we got through it? If we got to answer that question for you today and she was up here too, we would just say into the mic, the same way you can. The exact same same way that you can by holding fast to Jesus and United City Church sometimes in in spirituality sometimes holding fast to Jesus just just looks like clinging on for dear life sometimes it looks like just choosing love I mean there are so many opportunities that we could have chosen anything other than love for Jesus we could have chosen anger and fear and hate 
We could have chosen bitterness and destruction. We could have chosen divorce and going our separate ways and running from the problems. I could have gone back to pain pills and alcohol and drug management for my, for my emotions as therapy. But when you hold fast to Jesus and you find him as your refuge and your fortress, he doesn't overtake you. And you find a way to rise above. And this morning, United City Church, this morning, the plea is this. No matter what waves are crashing onto the shore of your life, hold fast to Jesus. Because he can be your refuge and he can be your fortress. Church, we worship because God is a fortress and a refuge. We worship and sing and respond and cling to him through singing and throwing up our hands and crying out to him because he's a safe place and because he's a fortress. So, so listen, I'm gonna pray. And when I pray, I want you to just think about this before you stand and sing. How do you need to respond to God right now? Do you need, do you need a refuge or do you need a fortress? Do you need to be safe from some things? Or do you need God to strengthen you and protect you as you keep fighting on and living for Jesus? It's, it's one or the other. How do you need to respond right now? What do you need? Do you need a refuge? Do you need a fortress? Because you can hold fast to Jesus and he'll hold fast to you. So God, right now in this moment, we prepare ourselves to respond. God, for every believer in the room, this moment is, is a built-in time to just rest in you or to be strengthened by you. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you do what only you can do? God, nothing else. Nothing else is as good as you. If we lose everything but still have Jesus, we have everything. So God, teach us to sing this song. Teach us to rest in the presence and the shadow. It's in your name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. What a powerful word from Pat Weichel out of the Psalms. We hope that the Lord spoke to you. And if you have questions... If you have a decision that you need to make today, whatever it is, we want to be the church and we want to link arms with you and celebrate what God is doing in your life right now. Do me a favor and text UC next to 55498. And we want to text you and have a conversation about any questions or next steps that you have in this journey and your faithfulness moving forward in response to what Jesus has done inside of you. Again, do me that favor. Text UC next to 55498. We just want to celebrate what God has done in your heart. We don't want you to miss out on what he has for you. So please do that. Another step that you can take too is text the word guide, G-U-I-D-E, to 55498. And that's going to send you an automated link each and every week, just with everything that's going on in the life of United City Church. And we pray for you. We strategize with you and your family in mind. And we really do believe that God has something special for you, not only this, this summer, but also in the fall coming up. And we really do believe that the best is yet to come. And do me another favor. If you could follow us on social media, share with your friends as well on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Those are just other ways that you can be more plugged in to what God is doing in our house here at United City Church. Don't miss out on it. We're praying with you. We believe the best is yet to come. And church, we love you. We'll see you next week.